been asked today to talk about uh, a very uh, controversial topic, if you will, in the nutrition world, uh, one that has a lot of misinformation associated with it. And that's the topic of cardiovascular disease, more specifically the topic of cholesterol and its role in cardiovascular disease. Uh, most individuals, and I'm assuming that uh, you, know, you folks fall into that category, have been bombarded with lots of messages, uh, either from the media or by well-intentioned but misinformed doctors, that you have to get your LDL levels checked constantly and you have to worry about cholesterol in food. What we're going to be learning about now is the actual uh, true role of cholesterol. And while it does have a role in heart disease, it's not as, if you will, um, extreme as the mainstream media like to report. So we're going to basically, hopefully, when you guys walk out of here in about an hour and a half or so, have a brand new, uh, maybe not love affair, but respect for cholesterol and its a fundamental role. I want to start by talking about cardiovascular disease first and give you a little bit of a preview of why there's an assumption that cholesterol causes heart disease. Okay? So here's basically the reason why we're talking about all this right now. Cardiovascular disease, CVD, is in fact the leading cause of death in the westernized world. This actually includes what we would refer to as heart disease, but it also includes stroke, which is a neurological issue when you don't get enough blood to the brain and you end up with brain damage, if you will. The reason why they're lumped together in the same category, even though, of course, you'd see a, a neurospecialist for a stroke and a cardio specialist for your heart, is because the process begins with the same uh, methodology. It's a methodology called atherosclerosis. And here's what atherosclerosis is. This is the actual literal definition that the students here learn using some of the advanced textbooks. Atherosclerosis is basically when a person has fatty deposits or plaque inside of their arteries. And this is a big deal because if you have plaque, it's going to affect the blood flow. Now the big mistake that people make every year is they assume that the fat that they've just eaten in their last meal, let's say they go to Red Lobster and have Surf and Turf, whatever, Admiral's Feast, uh, and they eat all this cholesterol and fat and melted butter, they think it instantaneously clogs their arteries. That's not the way the body works. There's actually a very specific process where you end up with dietary triggers that can lead to this type of deposition. Now I have actually a diagram, a photograph, of what a healthy artery looks like versus what a diseased artery looks like. And let me put that up on the screen here to show you. And hopefully this will actually come out nice enough on the screen. Now I know there's a bit of a glare here, but what you're basically looking at in this first diagram is the inner lining of a healthy artery. It's basically perfectly smooth, almost like a baby skin-like appearance. And that smooth interior lining is going to be vital because in a few moments when we learn about cholesterol, we're going to see that cholesterol is a very slippery substance. It can't stick to anything that is actually perfectly smooth. The diagram below shows the same location in an individual who has this atherosclerosis. And basically, the inside is now encrusted and darkened and is a lot more scabby, if you will. We've lost this perfectly smooth baby skin-like appearance, and it's actually turned into a rough uh, layer. Okay? So basically, there's what you actually end up with this scenario. You end up either with perfectly smooth interiors, or you end up with roughened interiors. Now the next picture is going to show you how you actually go from A to B, why you actually get from very, very smooth to very, very rough. And this one, I think, will be a lot more visible on the screen, because it's a black and white image. It's an illustration to show you the steps involved in the arterial structure. And that one's a lot more visible. This five sequence steps actually represents the pathway, the development, if you will, of these inner fatty blockages or plaques. And what I've underlined for students of the course, and what's kind of relevant for you if you're curious, the first three lines in step number one, injury to endothelium. The only reason why this plaque exists in the first place is because something has actually injured the inside of your arteries, that smooth baby skin-like appearance. In a few more moments, we're going to see that we have multiple, multiple layers in our outer skin. The inner skin lining the artery is a single cell layer thick, so it's extra delicate. If anything damages that location, the body's going to respond 
with the development of what we visibly see as a plaque. Right? So basically, when you're looking at this step, sequential step here, step two, step three, step four, step five, this is what the modern medical system accepts and acknowledges. And when we get there, we'll see that drugs are designed to stop this process from happening. In a way, it's kind of like stopping your body from healing. When you go to the emergency room with, you know, scrapes or cuts or bruises, no doctor's going to sit back and say, okay, we're just going to let you bleed out. They're, no, instead going to try to treat that wound. But interesting that when you have an internal injury, drugs like cholesterol-lowering medication, drugs like aspirin used to thin the blood, actually prevent this healing process from happening. So our strategy in the holistic world makes a little bit more sense. Rather than stopping the body from trying to heal itself, we're going to try to stop the initial injury from happening in the first place. Stop the injury, and you stop that roughened appearance that we uh, loosely saw in the previous diagram. Okay? So that's the first kind of goal of our approach, and we're going to see the role that cholesterol has to play very, very shortly. And that kind of emphasizes what I just talked about. Now, if you went to... I don't know, a dozen different holistic nutritionists or read a dozen different books, each book is going to have their own view on how to treat high cholesterol and heart disease as a whole. There basically, unfortunately, is no consensus in the medical community about what to do about it. So one book might say use this supplement, another book might say use uh, something else. Our goal, as I said, is to stop the initial damage from happening in the first place. So once I run down a couple of the uh, uh, historical significant facts of cholesterol, I'm going to present a few very simple and very, very safe supplements that you can easily find in a health food store that are proven to stop this damage from happening. Right? Even if you're on medication, even if you're taking cholesterol-lowering drugs, even if your doctor has put you on a cocktail of other uh, prescription meds, these are basic nutri nutrients that the human body needs anyway. So they have very, very high safety record. All right. All right. Let's take a look really quickly here at the composition of plaque. Earlier, I mentioned that the definition of CVD is to have fatty deposits in your arteries. But if you're actually a true scientist, you dig a little bit deeper than just those kind of uh, buzzwords. The plaque is actually made up of uh, a multitude of different agents. Fat is actually only a small fraction of that. In fact, the plaque is first made up of a chemical called fibrin, which is a protein, a protein responsible for clotting. That's evidence that you've actually damaged the artery lining. There's some fat in the form, chemical name is triglyceride, that's the uh, chemist's name of what we refer to as dietary fat. There are also surprisingly minerals. Minerals like calcium actually cause this structure to become hardened, and that's a big deal. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you caught this, but about two weeks ago, there was a huge article on the front page of the Toronto Star that said that calcium supplements were associated with heart disease. And it's something that's old news to a holistic <coughs> nutritionist. If you take too many calcium supplements in the wrong form and in the wrong time, you can end up with too much calcium in your arteries and cause blockages. What's amazing is that in Asia, they consume a fraction of the amount of calcium that we do usually because they don't consume as much dairy. Yet they don't have as much bone disease. They don't have as much osteoporosis. Here we're bombarded with people saying that, you know, if you're above the age of uh, whatever, 40, everyone needs to take calcium. If you're menopausal, calcium, calcium, calcium. And they don't talk about the dark side of calcium, calcification. So those of you that actually won the little door prize, the liquid calcium and magnesium, that stuff is actually good for you because we're going to be learning that if you take calcium, you have to take it with an almost equivalent amount of magnesium to prevent this from calcifying. All right? So good news. Uh, we're not about to give you heart disease basically at the school and then come uh, to the uh, overheads, right? Uh, muscle tissue and uh, cellular debris are further evidence that there's actually damage in the artery lining. And the final item to be laid down, the very last bit, if you will, of the plaque is the most misunderstood item, the theme of today. It's cholesterol. In a few moments, we're going to actually see that cholesterol is sort of like the biological bandage that gets attached on the surface of your wound. 
So to extend the analogy, if you go to the hospital with a big scrape or a big gash or a burn, they're going to put a dressing. They might put some antibiotic cream or ointment. They might wrap it with some cotton gauze, and then they'll actually put a dressing on the external layer to prevent it from getting contaminated and dirty. Cholesterol is that biological bandage that gets laid down at the very last moment. Here's another diagram to show you what I mean. It's an image, a different image, of a blocked artery. Here it is right here. A different image of a blocked artery. Now, in modern uh, physiology, they refer to these blockages as atheromas, an atheroma which makes it sound like it's kind of like cancer, carcinoma or sarcoma. It's not. Atheroma simply means it's actually a growth. And in this case, this is a growth because of the damage uh, to that single delicate layer inside of the arteries. If you look inside of it, you'll see it says remnants of dead cells, specules of calcium that actually give it that structure. And the thickest, darkest, and most obvious structure on the very top this book says is a fibrous cap. What they don't want you to know, this is from a medical book, what they don't want you to know is that it's actually a cholesterol cap. So that is supposed to be there. What do you think is going to happen when you take cholesterol lowering drugs? You stop producing the biological bandage. So it's almost like you end up with an improperly sealed wound. So we're going to talk about controlling cholesterol. Yes, we can't let cholesterol go willy-nilly in our blood levels, but we're going to learn about how to control it naturally without some of the risks associated with cholesterol-lowering medication. Okay? So here's a bit of an overhead to basically explain some of this uh, controversy. The high cholesterol theory. Now, because I'm giving you a condensed version here, students actually learn about six risk factors, six causes of that damage. We only have time in the hour or so uh, in our discussion to talk about cholesterol and in that in a very condensed form. The most accepted theory by medical practitioners is that high cholesterol causes plaque. And that if you have high cholesterol measured in your bloodstream, it is an automatically uh, sort of useful predictor of cardiovascular disease. We're not going to entirely negate this. We're going to say that, yes, cholesterol is associated with CVD, but it's not the measured form of cholesterol that the average medical doctor is tracking today, the famous measurement known as LDL ch cholesterol. Now, you might be wondering, how on earth can someone, a practitioner, claim that cholesterol isn't related to this disease? Uh, because we've been, dare I say, brainwashed for over a couple of generations now that cholesterol is the cause. Let me introduce the very first scientific study to show that cholesterol was a contributor of CVD. And it's a study still being referenced today by drug companies. It's a study that actually goes all the way back to 1913, to pre-revolutionary Russia, uh, with a researcher named Nikolai Anichkov. And Nikolai Anichkov designed an experiment. He was actually a Russian military doctor, a colonel in the Imperial Army. And there was a crisis. Uh, in the uh, Russian army at the time. They had enough peasants to basically be foot soldiers. They didn't have enough aristocrats to be officers. They were dying too early. So in a very militaristic fashion, the Imperial Army commissioned Anichkov to do studies to see why all these young officers were dying of heart disease. And what he did was design a study where he fed cholesterol to bunny rabbits. Seems kind of cruel today, but back in the day, feeding to mice and rats was kind of, uh, they were viewed as vermin and uh, disgusting creatures. But yes, you could actually test on bunny rabbits. And after feeding this cholesterol to a rabbit, he, uh, to a bunch of rabbits, he autopsied the rabbits and found that they all developed cardiovascular disease. From that moment on, the medical community has jumped onto the bandwagon that cholesterol causes blockages. Now, Holistically, there's a reason why this study is fundamentally flawed. And even though it's still being pushed by drug companies today, there's a basic, basic study design flaw. That study design flaw, cholesterol only comes from animal foods, eggs and dairy and meat. Vegetarian rabbits never eat cholesterol in their life cycle. So the problem with this study design is they actually fed a completely foreign substance 
to test subjects, the rabbits, that would normally never get any cholesterol at all, a completely foreign substance. What do you think would happen to the human body if we ate something that we were never supposed to? You know, if all of us sat here and ate, uh, I don't know, uh, chrome from car bumpers or, uh, you know, uh, iron nails, we'd probably get disease too. That doesn't mean that you're supposed to dismiss all sources of this agent. So the problem was what they fed to the rabbits. But the damage was done. After this study, they began to study populations in Russia first and then the rest of the world. And they sure enough found that whatever population had the lowest cholesterol consumption, peasants who couldn't afford the high cost of meat or the accessibility with lack of refrigeration to milk or eggs, whoever had the lowest cholesterol intake seemed to have the lowest rates of CVD. So cholesterol seems to be the linking factor. This is the theory that pretty much all of modern cardiology is based on today. What we're about to dispel is this particular myth. The myth that the cholesterol from foods is equal to the cholesterol in blood. If any of you have gone to your doctor uh, and you've tested for high cholesterol, they've likely given you a list of all these foods that you're supposed to avoid for life. I know my mom's a medical doctor. She's been doing this for years. Uh, is going to retire soon uh, and uh, slowly but surely is coming around. Uh, right around her last retirement year, she's finally acknowledging, yes, uh, kind of been misled by modern medicine. Uh, <laughs> cholesterol from foods is not the same as cholesterol in the blood. So you cannot assume that the cholesterol that you just ate in that piece of organic butter or that wholesome free-range egg is actually the same as what's happening in your system. So let me explain how there's a difference. The first is with this surprising fact. Perhaps some of you know it already, but uh, every year there are always a couple gasps when I mention this, that cholesterol is a natural and important substance that's actually produced in your body. In fact, as you sit there doing nothing, you are making more cholesterol than is ever humanly possible to eat in the food supply. The majority of your cholesterol, by some estimates up to 90%, are actually being manufactured as part of your genetic code. All human beings, in fact all animals, produce cholesterol for a very important reason. Here's just a short list of why we need cholesterol. Not a very good day for it today, but uh, with spring and summer around the corner, everyone talks about making vitamin D and getting sunlight. Well, surprise, vitamin D is actually made from the photoreaction of UV radiation from the sun mingling with cholesterol in your skin. So you cannot make a single milligram of vitamin D without having cholesterol in your body. Surprisingly, people who are on a lot of cholesterol-lowering drugs make less of vitamin D. And now there's a movement for a lot of seniors in particular who are on cholesterol-lowering drugs to take extra vitamin D as a precaution year-round, not just in the winter. All the bile that your body makes, a very important substance for the digestion of all fat. So if you wanted to basically digest both the good omega fats that everyone's talking about these days uh, and the bad fats, you actually need bile made from cholesterol. It's responsible for actually making a variety of hormones. And I'm going to have another diagram to show that very shortly. Uh, a huge variety of essential hormones. And probably the most important and most neglected role is the last statement there. The membrane found in all cells. In a few more uh, overhead moments here, a few more slides, we're going to see exactly why cholesterol has to be made in the membrane of your cells. It's basically to keep you alive and to prevent death by dehydration. So if you want to basically function for more than three days, pretty much the limit of uh, uh, survivability without intake of water, you have to have some cholesterol in your system. Okay? Let me actually talk about some of these hormones here, because I think this will also bring the message home very nicely. This is a, a nice little color diagram that I pulled from a uh, physiology textbook. And basically, it starts off showing you the structure of cholesterol at the very, very top. So it's a complicated ring-like structure, but the key part is that kind of gray uh, shaded ring area. From this parent uh, component, our body has the ability of manufacturing these variety of essential hormones. Uh, good point. Uh, this hormone in yellow, called cortisol, is a vital hormone that we need. In fact, it's the hormone that wakes you up in the morning from sleep. 
individuals who basically have problems with chronic, uh, almost, oh, dare I say, tardiness or laziness, if they can't wake up in the morning and they need multiple, multiple doses of caffeine or nicotine or whatever to wake them up, chances are they're not releasing cortisol at the right time of day, which should actually peak upon waking, part of your biological clock, and then should be gone for the rest of the day. Most of us make cortisol in the evening when we worry about our finances or worry about our future and then we end up with insomnia. So basically cortisol is actually made from this. Uh, some other hormones very relevant for pregnancy, progesterone, which is necessary for a pregnant woman to maintain the pregnancy for a full nine months. And probably the most important of all, look down here in blue, testosterone and estradiol or estrogen as it's more commonly known. Every molecule of testosterone in the male body and every molecule of estrogen in the female body starts off as a parent molecule of cholesterol. So now you can see why this chemical is so important to make in our bodies. If we did not have the ability to make it and we only relied on dietary sources, then all of these hormones, all your vitamin D, all your digestive bile would vary based on your last meal and that would mean imbalance. So at the end of the day, cholesterol plays some extremely vital roles in the body. Now here's another quick important statement, because some of you might say, fine, uh, I don't eat cholesterol, uh, how is it gonna be made in the body? Well, here's how it's made. The majority of the cholesterol is actually made in the liver, a key organ, and look what it's made from. Fats, sugars, and proteins. The human body is designed to be able to make cholesterol from anything. So if you go on a fat-free diet, but get sugar in your diet, it'll make cholesterol from there. Uh, whenever you see uh, sugar packets, and I've seen this in grocery stores, big one kilogram bag of cholesterol-free sugar made from sugar cane, it's a marketing ploy. Because if you were to eat that kilogram of sugar, and a lot of people do eat sugar uh, by the, uh, you know, the kilogram full each year, you can make cholesterol from it. Let's say you go on a sugar-free diet and a fat-free diet, but you eat some proteins. Well, surprise, you can get cholesterol from there. And even if you were starving yourself and ate no fats, no sugars, no protein, and decided to go on a starvation diet, you would still make cholesterol by breaking down the remnants of your body's components. So this is how important cholesterol is into the body, and it's been vilified by mainstream nutrition as a negative, okay? Now the key with this, and I'll be quick with this as well, is that cholesterol cannot just float by itself in the arteries. It's a complicated structure molecularly, so it has to be transported on the back of carriers. These carriers, by the way, are protein carriers. So here's a little bit of a preview. When a doctor measures your LDL and HDL, levels that we're gonna talk about very shortly, they're not technically measuring the cholesterol in your blood they're measuring the carriers of cholesterol in the blood. It's almost like if you had an aerial photograph of uh, traffic jams when you listen to whatever, 680 News, and all they're doing is looking for the number of taxi cabs or limousines. The taxis or limos are carrying, but you can't tell what passengers they're carrying. So judging a person by the number of transporters is not an accurate measure of the amount of cholesterol that you really have in your body. In a few more moments, we're gonna actually learn about the accuracy of cholesterol tests. And the reason why they're not as accurate as ideally hoped for is because again, you're not tracking cholesterol, you're tracking the carriers. And here are the two carriers that most people are familiar with, LDL and HDL. LDL cholesterol has a very specific transportation route. Think of it as a kind of one-way route, like taxi cabs driving people to the airport. LDL only carries cholesterol from the liver to the tissues where it's used to make hormones, vitamin D, bile, and all the other components that we talked about. So basically, LDL is oftentimes called the bad cholesterol, which I'm hoping by the end of this lecture you're gonna stop doing. It basically has a, you know, a, dare I see a, say a bit of a, a, a bum route, a, bit, a bad deal, uh, because it's transporting from the liver to the tissues and on the route, it can oftentimes have association with CVD. So the media today blasts LDL as being harmful and being toxic. You will be basically uh, unable to survive if your LDL levels were zero. 
So we do not want them to go all the way down to zero. In fact, it's an impossibility. We want to manage them so that we have the right amount of transporters uh, rather than clogging our route. HDL are kind of like the airport limousines that have a monopoly of bringing you back from the city. Uh, they have an exclusive route. HDL carries cholesterol from the tissues back to the liver for processing. So because of this kind of dichotomy of LDL going one way and HDL coming back the other way, HDL has been called the good because LDL is called the bad. In reality, they both have vital roles to play, and one is not good over the other. They're just doing their jobs. Right? So let's learn a little bit more about LDL and why there's a lot of misinformation about it. I'm going to reveal now a short list, and you can feel free to ask questions about this uh, if you like, a short list of reasons of why LDL gets elevated. Causes of high LDL. Now, the first cause is actually a very legitimate one. This first cause is genetics. Right? Some people genetically produce more cholesterol in their liver than others. Now, the only way to prove this is not asking if you have a parent or a family relative that had high cholesterol too. It's to actually get a test to prove that you carry the gene for this. And this is not something that your actual uh, physician, your run-of-the-mill doctor, is going to do. This is in the research field. So what most people are doing is simply asking, do you have heart disease running in your family? And when someone says yes, they automatically say it's genetics. Well, when you realize that heart disease and CVD is the leading cause of death in the Western world, pretty much every family has had someone who has CVD. So to say that it's genetic without proving genetics is very, very risky. Case in point, there's a reason why, it's controversial data, but it's, it's worth mentioning. Uh, in the U.S., they have a lot of uh, 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 nutritional data that's actually based on ra racial profiling. And what they found is that people of African descent <laughs> actually produce more cholesterol generally in their body. And there's a reason. People with darker skin tones need more cholesterol to make vitamin D from sunlight. People with paler skin tones who can easily, easily burn with a, a UV exposure can actually make vitamin D very, very quickly. So the idea is that genetically, individuals with uh, darker tones evolved to be from parts of the planet where there used to be a lot more powerful sunlight exposure. Now, because of immigration and migration, we've kind of lost this idea of looking at ethnic history as part of multicultural populations. Here in Canada, individuals of uh, Asian descent, South Asian descent, uh, Aboriginal descent, would rely on a lot more dietary sources of vitamin D to get them through the winter months. <laughs> People in the high Arctic would rely on seal meat and whale blubber, uh, etc. So it turns out that there is a genetic explanation for why certain ethnic groups have higher cholesterol levels. It's not a disease, it's just evolution. Brown eyes, blue eyes, blonde hair, dark hair. It's not a, a disease, it's just genetic differences between us. Okay, so if you have a family member that has CVD or heart disease, don't assume that it's entirely genetically coded unless you've had a proof that you've inherited this gene. Right. Far more likely are underlying health conditions. Diabetes is a major, major trigger for heart disease. Interesting that a lot of diabetics are told to control their sugar, but they still end up with blocked arteries. Hypothyroidism can also cause this. And consumption of the wrong types of nutrients. Saturated fat, trans fat, which come from a lot of processed foods. And as I hinted earlier, refined sugar can all be used to make cholesterol in the body. Now it might seem a little bit far-fetched, but I have another kind of diagram that perhaps some of you with a little bit of knowledge of chemistry might find uh, interesting. Uh, this is something that the students here actually learn. They take courses in body metabolism and biochemistry. And this particular overhead is one that they study in a lot more detail. This is just one overhead. They actually spend about an hour discussing each of the chemical steps. If you look at this, all sugars all fatty acids and all amino acids, which are nutritional talk for carbs, fats, and proteins respectively, can be broken down into a two-carbon fragment called acetate. From that two-carbon fragment, you can actually manufacture a precursor called squalene, 
which ultimately gets converted into the molecule cholesterol. So if you're a vegetarian that eats only plant-based foods and never gets any animal-based cholesterol in your diet, you are still manufacturing cholesterol by this mechanism. So those of us that might actually be binging on a lot of these items, bad trans fats, bad refined sugar, are blissfully unaware that we are churning out more cholesterol in our uh, diet. The doctor will uh, do a test, and if it's above a certain number, they'll prescribe you drugs without maybe even examining your dietary record. Right? So this is why we have to be wary that cholesterol can be made from anything. Now here's another reason why we have to be a little bit uh, disciplined with our diet. And it's something that is probably a chronic issue in uh, the North American diet. It's lack of fiber, lack of dietary fiber. You're always bombarded with messages to try to buy uh, whole wheat bread and uh, all brand cereal and etc. Part of the reason is because fiber has a medicinal role on your blood chemistry. What fiber does, and I'll, maybe I'll draw a, root, a rough sketch on the blackboard here to show you, is fiber binds to bile in the intestinal tract. And when you have a bowel movement, you flush it out of your body. So let me get a little sketch going here. I've got some chalk over here to kind of demonstrate. If this is sort of uh, an illustration of your intestinal tract, and you basically have some bile in your intestinal tract, remember this was the stuff that we need for digestibility, this bile can bind with dietary fiber from your last meal. So let's say you had a wonderful oatmeal or some type of whole grain cereal or that kind of idea uh, for breakfast. The fiber in that's going to bind to bile irreversibly. And when you have a bowel movement, this actually becomes eliminated. Now the reason why this is relevant is because we just said the body makes bile from cholesterol. So every time you eliminate it with a, a, a fecal movement, your body has to make fresh bile. And where does that bile come from, uh, cholesterol come from? It comes from non-essential sources, meaning it comes from the LDL circulating around your bloodstream. So to finish off this diagram, here basically is your blood. And the result of this kind of simplistic item is LDL is going to actually get converted loosely into bile. And so the net result is that your LDL levels go down because you've eliminated bile in the uh, stool. It's a squeamish topic to, for people to, to discuss, but I always joke about this. And uh, the fact is, is that you have a lot more powerful cholesterol-lowering effect from a good old-fashioned bowel movement or dump than you will from any type of uh, cholesterol-lowering <laughs> drug. It's the safest, most effective, cleansing, non-toxic way of lowering your cholesterol. It's also how a lot of companies can make the claim that if you eat their their product, you can lower cholesterol. You've probably seen it on Cheerios, right? Cheerios helps to lower cholesterol. It's because Cheerios, even though it's a very processed product and not very holistic, contains fiber. Right? So every time you have a bowel movement, this is actually good news. Surprise, the students here learn um, well before they get to this topic of cardiovascular disease, they learn about bowel health and bowel cleansing. And until you actually address proper elimination, dealing with chronic constipation, you're not going to make a dent in this. Doctors don't acknowledge this because the heart is the specialty of a cardiologist and the bowels are the specialty of a gastroenterologist. So you see different specialists even though there is a connection. Amazing that since fiber is not digested and never gets into your blood, it's an amazing substance that can actually change your blood chemistry. Right? So yes, it turns out there's a reason why drug companies don't actually market this because this stuff is available for free in the uh, food supply. So they're not going to make a profit by try selling you fiber tablets, if you will. Okay? You have a question? Well, uh, it's a good point. Uh, there are different types of fiber that actually do this. And uh, what uh, uh, the question was is, is this actually called soluble or insoluble fiber? Chemists basically divide fiber into two parts based on how it dissolves in water. Insoluble fiber is the stuff that we're most familiar with. It's the roughage that you see in uh, wheat flakes and shredded wheat and whole wheat bread. 
Soluble fiber, which means that it's uh, soluble in water, is the type that actually forms a kind of gel. Think of oatmeal that gets all slimy, or okra when you cook it and it gets all slimy. Uh, soluble fiber is the desirable one. So to answer this question, yes, you're actually looking for the fiber that's much more found in fruits and vegetables rather than the type of fiber that's found in grains. So a lot of people say, well, I'm making a big deal. You know, I stopped eating white bread, and now I only eat whole wheat bread. Good for you. Uh, you're, you're, that's a plus, uh, better than doing nothing. But the type of fiber in whole wheat bread is the wrong type of fiber for this effect. It's useful for other items. But if you actually go to the grocery store and buy wheat bran and bake a whole bunch of bran muffins, I've seen this, people go and buy white flour that's processed, then they go and buy wheat bran, make a bran muffin so they can help with their constipation. It's the most <laughs> ludicrous aspect in nutrition. Uh, frankly, <laughs> grains are not the best source of soluble fiber. The exception are oatmeal, items like ground flax, and maybe some other agents like uh, quinoa and um, millet, which have a very kind of slimy consistency when you consume them. So generally speaking, you want soluble fiber, which comes in vegetables and fruit. <coughs> okay, so it's a very good question. Now there's another mechanism here that's actually very related, and it's a shock for people who have never heard about it before. It's the role of <coughs> water and cholesterol. Dehydration has been capitalized here for effect because the students learn it's a m underlooked aspect of disease. Basically, the role of cholesterol in all animal tissue, not just our own, but for all living animal uh, creatures on the planet, the role of the cholesterol is to affect permeability to water, to basically influence how much water goes in and out of your cells. If you are dehydrated and the body is sensing an emergency circumstance, it will actually increase cholesterol for the express purpose of preserving water loss from these cells. And how does that cholesterol get to those tissues? Let's say you're losing a lot of water in your skin because you're sweating or you're active. If you lose enough water down to a certain percentage, you can actually end up in a form of dehydration shock. So to prevent that from happening, your body begins to transport cholesterol to those skin cells in an effort to prevent this water loss. And that is why LDL levels actually look like they've gone up. A doctor won't actually uh, assess this. They just look at the numbers. And if the number is above a certain number, you're guaranteed to be put on the drug, period. What we're saying is, yes, some people might need medication, but before you go down that road, look at other reasons why cholesterol might be elevated. In a dehydrated state, everything gets tightened up and sealed. So you see the membrane now becomes much tighter, and these items, these tails, sort of interlock in this structure. It says down here that you end up manufacturing cholesterol to stick these bricks together as a way of preventing water from flowing out. This is an adaptation to dehydration. So who would have thought that water loss in the body could be a reason why cholesterol levels seem to never go down. They always constantly seem to be elevated. This, by the way, is a secret link that explains cholesterol elevation in what students here learn are dehydration disease states. The reason why diabetics oftentimes show cholesterol levels through the roof is because diabetics oftentimes have lots of water loss due to their imbalance in blood chemistry. They're constantly urinating excess sugar, and as a consequence, they end up losing too much water. Right? So the way you manage that is manage the dehydration issue. Individuals who have a history of obesity. Obesity, by the way, defined not by a person's weight, but by the percentage of body fat to muscle mass that make up their composition. So you can't look at a person on the street and say you're obese because you look big. What matters is how much muscle mass they have compared to body fat. In fact, a lot of students are shocked in the program when we bring these devices into the school and they actually get their own body fat checked. They look like they're in the best shape of their life, uh, you know, lean, relatively uh, uh, skinny individuals. And when they look at their proportionality, they realize that they have the wrong mixture of fat to muscle in their body. Don't judge a person based on their size or shape. You base it on their percentage of muscle to body fat. 
The more muscle you have, the more water you have in your system. The more body fat you have, the less water you have. So this individual needs to drink more water in order to prevent dehydration. Right? The textbook that we use for this course actually mentions that the water that you use to drink the cholesterol-lowering pills and to wash it down with is better for you than the actual <laughs> cholesterol-lowering pill in terms of safety and efficacy in the long term, right? So yes, there's this controversy here. Now here's the problem with actual tracking of LDL levels. The problem with this LDL cholesterol theory is that not everybody with high LDL dies of CVD. There are some individuals that, as I said, have cholesterol levels through the roof, never get it checked or examined, and they live to a ripe old age. Other people with cholesterol within the low range and they suddenly spontaneously have a heart attack that nobody saw coming. The reason why this is relevant is because it is not an accurate enough predictor. People assume that it's a direct one-to-one -one correlation, that if cholesterol goes up, your heart attack risk goes up directly proportional. On the next overhead, we're going to learn that that's actually not true. It's not very proportional, and I think you're going to be utterly uh, um, uh, frustrated when you learn the accuracy of LDL testing. Furthermore, drug treatments are designed to do one thing and one thing only. Drugs are designed to lower LDL, and that's it. There has never been a study to show that LDL drugs actually extend life. And the reason? A drug company does not have to prove that it extends life. Under court, uh, current kind of international and local laws here, a drug company only has to prove what it claims. And you can bet that these multi-billion dollar companies have millions of wor dollars worth of lawyers being very careful about their press releases and what they can say. No drug company makes the claim that this drug will save your life, extend your life. All they claim is that it lowers LDL. And that's true. These drugs are, uh, and the marketing behind them, there's no lying. They do, in fact, lower LDL. But they don't actually have the evidence to prove that it extends life. It's all based on extrapolation and assumption. Turns out that many of these medications are actually toxic to the liver. And the reason? They stop LDL being produced in the liver. So, the question is, is it really a good idea to suppress people's livers, a very important organ of function, just because we want to lower LDL because of studies that go all the way back to 1913 in pre-revolutionary Russia, right? So the idea is, is that there is no drug on the market that actually hits all of the risk factors in one fell swoop. No medication that lowers LDL, raises HDL, lowers fibrin, and lowers the plethora of other agents out there. So our goal right now is to discuss the holistic solution, which I think you'll find is not only safe uh, and virtually affordable for all of us, uh, and uh, uh, certainly very powerful. Okay, so let's explain that in more detail. Here's the holistic explanation of cholesterol. Contrary to what a lot of uh, medical doctors have reported, kind of basically saying that you're either with us or against us on this cholesterol theory. You're either with us or you're a quack against us. So the idea behind this is, let's look at the uh, holistic mechanism. <coughs> the holistic mechanism is that high LDL is not a problem. It's oxidized LDL that is the problem. And there is a subtle difference between the two. One that is not measured unless you're in research circles and universities and et cetera. High LDL, not the problem, high oxidized LDL. And the reason is because only oxidized LDL has the capacity to damage the artery wall, which if you recall at the very start of our lecture this, uh, this afternoon, we mentioned was the origin of CVD. You cannot have cholesterol stick to a smooth skin-like appearance in the artery lining unless there is damage to that artery lining. Only oxidized cholesterol does this. How does oxidized cholesterol occur? Oxidized cholesterol occurs because your diet is too poor in antioxidants. Individuals who aren't getting enough nutritional antioxidants, a few of which we're going to uh, discuss right now, the most famous of which is vitamin E. If you don't get enough vitamin E from your diet, and perhaps from an occasional low-dose supplement, your cholesterol, which is naturally going to be flowing around, 
will ultimately oxidize. Now here's the point I can quickly make here. Vitamin E levels in the blood are actually a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than LDL measurements. Now this is taken not from me, this is taken from the medical established literature used by the textbook in this course. Now this textbook, by the way, is almost a decade old now uh, in terms of trying to promote, the original publication anyways, a decade old in trying to promote doctors to get a new way of looking at things. And it's fallen, I'm afraid, on deaf ears. Still today, LDL is used as the gold standard when there was evidence as long as 10 years ago to show how inaccurate it was. Look at this. High LDL levels equals 29% risk of CVD. What that means is that it's accurate only 29% of the time. Take 100 people with high cholesterol and only 29 of them will end up with vascular disease or a heart attack. The other 71% will live long, healthy lives and never have a problem. Look how inaccurate that is. You can imagine that if the home pregnancy test was this inaccurate, people would be up in arms, uh, or the HIV test or other kind of medicated test. But this is still the standard being used today with only 29% accuracy. Meanwhile, low vitamin E is accurate to 70%. Now it's still not perfect, and we're not gonna claim that it's the perfect test, but it's a better test than LDL measures alone. Take 100 people with uh, low vitamin E, and 70 of those individuals are gonna end up with heart damage. That's pretty significant in terms of statistical analysis. So very shortly, we're gonna learn about the amount of vitamin E you need for this protection. It's actually achievable in your diet if you're eating the proper foods. And if you want to take a little bit of a supplement, I'm gonna be talking about a very safe, effective dose that is uh, accepted as being uh, usable for the vast majority of individuals, okay? So this also, by the way, explains the famous French paradox why uh, the French, the European French, not our Quebecois uh, neighbors, the European French do all uh, the wrong dietary habits. They eat more saturated fat, they eat more eggs and more cholesterol and uh, you have more butter and etc. Yet they have lower rates of heart disease. They call this the French paradox and they've tried to attribute it to wine. And it's a fabrication basically. Uh, the reason, uh, other studies have shown that in other pockets where wine is consumed, and we Canadians with our Niagara Belt region are also very much wine consumers, the Quebecois very much wine consumers, but they do not have the heart disease prevention of their French kin over the, uh, uh, the ocean. In Quebec, they actually have more heart disease uh, than in some places in the U.S. states. And it's not because the wine is there offering protection, it's because the diet is heavily processed and junky. So they've adopted a North American style diet with European style wine consumption, but the wine alone is not protective enough. In a few moments, I'm also gonna have, kind of disappointing if you're a wine lover, I'm gonna have some studies to show just how effective wine is. <laughs> and it's modest at best. So if you're trying to justify your uh, you know, wine cellar as uh, good for your heart, uh, there's a bit of a, a, a myth associated with wine usage. Okay, so those are some issues that we want to talk about. In the holistic world, we don't care about your LDL number, we care about whether or not that cholesterol has become oxidized. Okay, so let's talk about some dietary solutions now about this idea. Oh, I can mention this really quickly too. Uh, it's not just a uh, you know, uh, fringe, holistic school of thought. Even some mainstream organizations are acknowledging this. This is a cover of Time magazine, and look at this. It says cholesterol, and now the good news, because you see a happy face with eggs and a smiley face made with a strip of melon, loaded with antioxidants and, by the way, soluble fiber. It's relevant because 15 years earlier, Time Magazine ran an article with a sad face made out of a strip of bacon to show you that if you ate eggs and bacon, you were gonna get sick uh, and have heart disease. In a way, it's kinda true. Eggs with bacon does not contain fiber, does not contain antioxidants. Eggs with fruit or some other type of association does allow for this antioxidant usage. So the message is, is that what is kind of holistic today is eventually becoming mainstream. Doctors, it turns out, are the last holdout in the conservative medical body. Okay, so let's talk about some dietary solutions about what we can do uh, in terms of uh, this management. 
Now, because of uh, our time here, I'm going to quickly go through some of these solutions. Not all of these are appropriate for each and every one of you, especially this first uh, uh, treatment, which I should emphasize should only be done under the guidance of a practitioner. I'm only mentioning because it is the most famous natural way of lowering cholesterol. I'm not a very big fan of it personally, and I don't think that many other instructors at the school are, but it does have a pretty proven history. And this is high dose niacin, vitamin B3. Now for this to work, you can't use diet alone. You have to use pills. And because this school really tries to promote healthy eating more than just pill pushing, this is more of a, a, a short term solution, not a long term one. But I thought it'd be warranted to mention. Niacin at 500 milligrams three times a day, that's a very, very heavy dose, can lower your LDL levels and boost HDL. It's the only agent that has ever been studied with clinical data to lower LDL but also decrease mortality. So remember we said earlier, drug companies don't have to test for life extension. But this product has actually been tested to show that it not only lowers death from CVD, but it also lowers LDL measurements. Sounds too good to be true. And there's always a catch with everything. Uh, the catch is that while drugs do not address these other risk factors, there are some, frankly, unpleasant superficial side effects with niacin. Something known as niacin flushing. The skin actually turns very, very red. People with darker skin tones might not see this, but they'll feel it. They end up with a massive heat release, kind of like a menopausal hot flash. So it's obviously not very pleasant. Uh, you can also end up with GI irritation, a bit of feeling of nausea, uh, and kind of burning in your uh, intestinal tract. Now this sounds horrific, and for a lot of people who experience this without expecting it, they think that they're having an allergy attack, they start looking in the mirror, turning red, having this uh, heat release. Uh, they might even start having a panic attack, hyperventilate, and people have been known to pass out. I can tell you that as an instructor here, routinely, students, especially at the beginning of this year, when they come to the school thinking that they're all healthy, with uh, handfuls and handfuls of supplements washing down with uh, soup or whatever, Everyone suffers from a nice and flush at one time or another here in, in campus. And uh, it looks horrible, and I basically tell them that you have to wait it out. 20 minutes, uh, there are some modest things you can do, cold water, etc. Uh, you can also drink some tea or caffeine, which will lower this. But realistically, this is much more, if you will, uh, bark than bite. It looks a lot worse than it really is. It doesn't cause any long-lasting permanent damage. It's simply a response of absorbing too much niacin too quickly. Now the surprise, you do not get this flush with drugs. So a person who uses a cholesterol drug doesn't feel any different, and so they think it's safer. But in the long term, cholesterol drugs are more dangerous to your liver than this skin flushing is to your body. So it's once again an idea of superficial uh, 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 side effect versus kind of invisible side effect that you won't know until it's too late, liver damage. Right? Now one of the ways to get around this is to try to buy flush-free versions. But unfortunately, the flush-free version that is most found in health food stores does not make a dent in your LDL levels. It's a brand called, or a form I should say, niacinamide. All over the label they'll say flush-free, flush-free, side effect free. But unfortunately that's not going to be usable for our purpose. Instead, the most tolerable version also happens to be the most expensive. So there is a bit of a, a catch-22. It's this version called IH6, or inositol hexaniacinate. Sounds very technical, but this particular form of vitamin B3 has been engineered to be very slow release in your system. And that means when you swallow it, uh, typically with meals, so that it nice is uh, absorbed gradually and slowly in the GI tract, you won't end up with this flushing. So if an individual says, don't use niacin, it makes you all red and gets you flushed, it's usually the form, the dose, and how you're actually using it. Uh, number one mistake people make is they wash it down on an empty stomach with a warm beverage like a warm coffee first thing in the morning or a tea. They skip breakfast, take their multi and say, I'm going to survive on this multi. And because of the hot 
beverage coupled with the dose in the supplement, you end up with this flush. Now I said at the start of this that this is not recommended. I don't want any of you to go to the health food store, buy all this stuff and start dosing on yourself because there is a catch with this. And the catch is if you're going to use this for longer than three months, which is usually what happens, you actually have to check your liver. No different than if you were to actually check with uh, prescription drugs. Technically, if you're on these prescription cholesterol lowering drugs, that doctor is supposed to examine your liver frequently. And uh, basically with waiting lines and uh, waiting times increasing all over the province, this is usually being discarded. This fact is very, very relevant. So if you're going to consider uh, or have been recommended this therapy by a practitioner, it's your onus to have your own liver examined every three months. For this reason, personally, I'm not a fan of this, and many other instructors are not a fan of this therapy. There's a lot more you can do to more safely lower cholesterol using food and diet rather than a high-dose supplement. Okay, so let me actually introduce those and we'll put this uh, by the wayside here. Here's a supplement that's actually considered to be useful. Also in uh, health food store uh, versions, it's called pantothene. And it's a stable form of vitamin B5 that also reduces cholesterol synthesis in the liver. Now drug companies are very, very upset at this. Uh, for a while, there was a push to basically get this substance restricted in Canada, and it failed, thankfully. The reason is because it actually mimics the action of a lot of cholesterol-lowering drugs without the liver toxicity of the cholesterol-lowering drugs. So you can imagine how much of a dent it would make in the prescription drug world if people started switching to this. Uh, this is pantothene, not available in the food supply, so you have to dose it as a supplement. Be careful, because if you go to the health food store and decide to use this as a very safe, effective cholesterol-lowering agent, you want to make sure you're getting the right form. Most B5 is in the form called pantothenic acid. It's cheaper, more available, and uh, easy to extract, and that's why it's actually put into the food stuff. This is a modified form that has to be modified by the company. Pantothene. And because of this modification, it's much more expensive and therefore it's reflected in the cost. So don't just get any old run of the mill B5. Not all B vitamins are created equivalently. Okay. Having said all this though, both B3 and B5 do the same thing. They lower cholesterol in the liver. Some holistic practitioners, myself included, have questioned whether or not we should actually be trying to suppress the liver in doing its job. After all, cholesterol or LDL can be elevated because there is dehydration in the body or because there's some other uh, deficiency in the body. Rather than turn off our LDL producing ability, we want to prevent it from becoming damaging oxidized LDL. And that's why the next supplement, uh, a static one, I'm sure one that maybe all of you are taking, most health nuts are, it's plain old fashioned vitamin C. Plain old fashioned vitamin C. Now vitamin C has a couple of uh, important roles. The first is that it's the major protective agent that prevents the artery wall from initial damage. The more vitamin C you get on a daily basis, the stronger your arteries are against potential damaging components. Right? Most individuals think of vitamin C only when cold and flu season rolls around. And now that we're kind of done with our winter, uh, uh, things are turning away from vitamin C and uh, whatever. People are told to take uh, antihistamines and whatever for uh, um, seasonal allergies and hay fever, yes. Vitamin C, it turns out, is in fact more powerful for the heart than it is for colds and flu. But it hasn't been marketed as such. It helps to boost HDL levels even in well-nourished people with normal vitamin C levels in the blood. And this is a bit of an interesting phenomenon. If perchance your doctor measures vitamin C levels in the blood and you're already at maximum vitamin C, they will tell you don't waste your money on a supplement. Your blood is already saturated. But studies have shown that your blood levels of vitamin C are not a reflection of the amount you need to boost HDL. This is because this vitamin C is not floating around in your blood. It's vitamin C that is inside that delicate lining in the arteries. 
So it's referred to as cellular vitamin C. Very important. It also lowers another risk factor, the stickiness of a chemical called LPA, uh, which can also jam up and clog your arteries. And here's a biggie that's relevant. It regenerates vitamin E in the body. Nine times out of 10, if an individual basically has read about nutrition and heart disease, they're gonna read about vitamin E. Oftentimes, that person ends up taking an excessively high dose of vitamin E that runs the risk of risk factors, blood thinning and other complications. Holistically, vitamin E never exists by itself. So taking a vitamin E supplement by itself doesn't make any logical nutritional sense. In fact, it makes a lot more sense to take vitamin C because it is sort of like the electrical recharger of your vitamin E molecule. I think I have a diagram here to basically uh, demonstrate this as well for you. Uh, hopefully I actually packed it in here. Uh, yes, here it is right here. This little diagram shows you what happens when a chemical called a free radical, in our case, you could interchange free radical with oxidized cholesterol. They're the same term, if you will. Vitamin E comes and stops or disarms that agent. Once it actually disarms it, unfortunately, vitamin E becomes toxic in that brief moment of time. So in order to neutralize the vitamin E, the body uses vitamin C in order to recycle it. In that moment of time, vitamin C becomes toxic and the chain continues down. A chemical called glutathione recharges uh, uh, vitamin C. Anthocyanidins uh, recharge glutathione. What you're looking at here is the true holistic model of antioxidants. They never work by themselves, they work as a full-fledged team. You'd never expect to you know, win the Stanley Cup with only a goalie in your net, uh, but this is exactly what happens when an individual takes vitamin E by itself. You're taking one member of the team and expecting it to basically uh, uh, you know, make you uh, completely protected, a uh, complete ridiculous fabrication. I think the reason why people are lulled into doing this is because in the drug community, that is how they validate the uses of medication. One isolated drug to prove that it actually works. Nutrients never work along that line. They have to be worked uh, about in concert. So this is why we're gonna be seeing that while we're talking about vitamin E, the dose of vitamin E that we will suggest is low compared to the dose of vitamin C that we're suggesting. Vitamin C recharges vitamin E. Okay. To prove this, and if you're wondering how much you basically need for this effect, it's a modest dose that uh, is challenging to get in diet, but doable if you actually avoid all processed foods and eat very, very fresh. It's 1,000 milligrams a day. Many individuals, by the way, by virtue of their supplements uh, and their fortified foods are actually exceeding this. As a bit of an aside, uh, Students here have to do an assignment on themselves where they do a one-day diet diary and actually analyze their calories, their fat grams, their amount of vitamin C and calcium. And every year, students actually are shocked to find out just how much vitamin C they are getting in a natural whole foods diet. Right? This study was based on 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, an easy uh, uh, done one-a-day tablet, if you will. 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C has better antioxidant capacity than a glass of red or white wine. This evaluation here tracked the substance, white wine, red wine, and vitamin C, at the end of one hour and at the end of two hours. Now, how does it work? They basically got a bunch of human guinea pigs, if you will. Would have been nice to be part of that study. You got to drink up, I guess. So you drink your wine, you drink your uh, components, and then they actually draw a sample of blood. At the end of one hour, they take that blood and they bombard it with free radicals and they see how long your blood can survive this onslaught of chemicals. At the end of two hours, they draw another sample of blood and do the process again. If that substance has boosted your antioxidants, your blood should be able to survive that chemical abuse. At the end of one hour, white wine increases your antioxidant capacity by a very modest 
7% at the end of two hours. So yes, the wine industry loves this study because it makes it show that if you drink wine, you're going to see a boost in antioxidants. Red wine is always going to be better than white. The reason? The pigments in red wine have much more antioxidant ability. And that's why you see at the end of one hour, it was 18% elevation. That's pretty massive for you know, your leisurely consumption of just a glass of uh, red wine. But look at what happens at the end of two hours. It drops to 11%. 11 is still better than 7% of white wine. So people still argue that red will always be better than white. But there's a reason why the red wine has decreased. All red wines contain substances called sulfites that I'm sure you've heard of to preserve the color. Sulfites, when they're detoxified in our liver, produce more free radicals. So the peak of antioxidant usage is at the end of one hour in red wine, because at the end of two hours, you're actually in a net toxic state. There's no such thing, by the way, as sulfite-free wine. If you've gone to the LCBO and you're buying organic sulfite-free wine, it's a misleading label. Sulfite-free simply means that the producer is not allowed to add extra sulfites after a certain stage in the process. But all red wines must contain sulfites. Otherwise, within a number of days, your wonderful Shiraz or Cabernet or whatever red wine is going to turn into balsamic vinegar color. And nobody wants brown red wine, right? So those pigments have to be preserved with sulfites found within it. When you look at this study, vitamin C far outpaces the rest. At the end of one hour, a 22% increase. And at the end of two hours, a 29% increase in antioxidant boosting. Why? Because vitamin C is an antioxidant that protects that initial lining, but it also regenerates vitamin E downstream. So this means that, yes, your good old-fashioned vitamin C that might be collecting dust in your uh, cupboards because it's not flu season anymore, take it out and start consuming it. That's actually what's very heart healthy. Quick question? Are all vitamin C supplements created equal? I've heard a lot of controversy. Some no. Uh, are toxic and uh, the, well, they really wouldn't be toxic, but they, toxic, they. but uh, synthetic, I meant synthetic. Synthetic, yes. I can actually answer your question. Let me erase this on the board here, and then I can explain a little difference between them. <clears throat> there is absolutely a difference between uh, vitamin C brands, if you will. Now, the way it basically works is this is the chemical name of vitamin C that a chemist will recognize. It's called ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid. Next time you're buying some apple juice or orange juice, look at the ingredient list, and they've actually added vitamin C in it to increase the vitamin content in the form of ascorbic acid. Now, the difference is, where do they get this ascorbic acid from? It's extremely expensive to try to extract it from living tissue, from citrus or berries or whatnot. But it's possible to do that. Uh, most of this actually comes because of a synthetic manufacturing process. They take corn, specifically the corn starch, they convert the corn starch to glucose, which is a sugar, and then they convert the glucose to vitamin C. The cheapest vitamin C's, especially the chewable ones, are going to be corn-based, and these are basically uh, less effective. Even though this is synthetically made, I should be fair, if you will, and objective to the industry, this chemical reaction actually occurs in the body of many animals. It doesn't occur in the body of human beings, but other animals like uh, mice, birds, uh, reptiles actually take glucose from the starchy foods they might eat and convert it to vitamin C. Human beings cannot make this process, so the manufacturing plant does it for us. Mm -hmm. Now here's the reality. As I just said, vitamin C doesn't exist by itself in nature. What you want is a blend. And generally, the better quality companies are going to have vitamin C, let me erase this as well, that might confuse the language here, uh, plus bioflavonoids, yes. Bioflavonoids are the components that actually help to regenerate vitamin C. Uh, they're the minor components. And here's a good little point about how food is oftentimes ignored. Everyone squeezes their oranges or their lemons first thing in their morning to get the juices and the vitamin C content. There's actually only a fraction of vitamin C found in the pulp. 
the majority of the vitamin C is actually in the white bitter pith that is right underneath the peel. But it's too bitter. The reason? The bioflavonoids do not taste sweet. So if you wanted to maximize and you uh, wanted to get this from nature, you wouldn't throw away that white part. Or if you do peel your grapefruit or oranges, try to preserve as much of that white part as possible. And you get vitamin C with flavonoids. So if you're looking at different brands, you know, brands come and brands go. I'm not going to be endorsing any specific brand over another because the industry uses the same straight point. But you are kind of getting what you pay for. The cheaper uh, ones that you might see at a drugstore are plain old fashioned vitamin C synthetic. Uh, they might also, by the way, be in a base of added refined sugars and processed junk. So what you really want is vitamin C in a base of bioflavonoids. Right? Fair enough. Is the bioflavonoid synthetic? No, these bioflavonoids are usually extracted from the plant matter that they should be extracting vitamin C from. want to safely lower cholesterol levels uh, and do so with a little bit of, uh, dare I say, flavor in your life. And that is garlic and onions. Right. Garlic and onions are the next item on this list. Specifically within garlic, a lot of people say it's the, the vitamins or the minerals, but it's not. Garlic and onions as a food family contain a very unique uh, group of chemicals too technical for us to discuss right now, but they are basically sulfur compounds, which is responsible, of course, for that distinct aroma of this food family. Now, today's modern world makes you think that all of us have to be popping supplement pills to basically get solution, but I'm about to reveal some data to show you that simply eating garlic and onions, in some cases, in modest amounts uh, over a week, can have net impact. This scientific study was actually done, before I reveal the numbers, I'll set it up here for you. This study was actually done in India. And what they did is they traveled to a uh, part of India where they had three villages that were within similar geographic regions. The populations were relatively homogenous. That is, they were pretty much of the same ethnic uh, uh, groups. The only difference between these three villages was their accessibility and usage of garlic and onions. Basically, because of religious reasons, one group of village elders banned the use of garlic and onions in their uh, uh, village. And the reason is because it was viewed as an aphrodisiac. So it basically, well, I guess that was the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, village where they said, no garlic and onions, right? So no fun. Uh, um, the other village had modest usage, and the third village had a liberal, uh, I guess it was the Las Vegas of the uh, India area, where they could eat as much of this uh, garlic and onions as they wanted. What was fascinating about this is that they tracked, the researchers, all the other dietary components, and they were basically the same. These people ate whole grain uh, non breads and lentils and some spinach, some dairy products, so they did have some cholesterol in their diet. The only variable that was drastically different from community to community was garlic and onions. So this was a U.S. study, and that's why the numbers here are in U.S. values. I'll help you interpret them mm -hmm. shortly. You don't really need to write this down. You can just kind of observe for your own uh, leisure. The first village where they consumed quite a lot, 50 grams of garlic a week with 600 grams of onion a week. Now, if you need to visualize this, I've done this calculation before for other students, 50 grams is the equivalent of 10 cloves of garlic a week. So a little bit more than a clove a day, right? So quite a liberal amount. 600 grams is about a pound and a half. So this is about a pound and a half of onions uh, uh, a week. By the way, this was cooked. So these people weren't eating this stuff like you know, nuts and seeds and apples. They were actually cooking with it in this format. And they had the lowest cholesterol values, 159 uh, mg per dl. One and a half of onions, you said? One and a half pounds of onions, yes, cooked. The, the, the like? Say again? The yes, the per week, it said. Uh, For the daily basis now. How many onions a day? Well, you'd have to work out the math yourself. So, I mean, 600 grams, you'd have to divide that by seven. So that's uh, you know, a little bit less than 100 grams uh, a day. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, one gram is uh, 400. So it's about a quarter, a quarter of a pound of onions a day, if you wanted to work it out. And I don't know how much of an onion that is. It's the best math I could do on short notice. But yes, uh, you're, you're talking about roughly a quarter pound of an onion chopped, right? Uh, Garlic, uh, 10 grams per week, which is the equivalent of two cloves a week. 
very, very reasonable. And 200 grams, so there you basically see that value a week. Right? Their uh, value was 172 to 75 milligrams. And look at the community that had no garlic or onion. They had the highest level of all. Now the reason why this is relevant is because in the United States, if your cholesterol is above 200, you're an automatic candidate for cholesterol lowering drugs. So basically, this would have been a boon for that drug company. Everyone in that village basically had an average score above 200. Fascinating that this study did not track death associated with CVD. All they did was track garlic, influence, and onions influencing the levels. They did not track outcomes. So the point of this study is to show you that even food can have a medicinal effect. No garlic or onion caused these individuals to have levels above, quote, normal. Right? In Canada, the magic number is 5.2. If your cholesterol is above 5.2, you're a candidate. 200 is 5.2. So we in the Canadian system use a different measure, but it's pretty much the same line drawn in the sand. 200 mg's per dl or 5.2 uh, millimoles per liter in Canada, and you are a candidate for pills. So this shows you that there is, in fact, a nutritive effect just from the diet alone. Now the industry, therefore, question. sure, go ahead. You mentioned about cooked onions and garlic. If it's raw, I mean, there's a lot of people that say raw is better. Yes. You know, you know yes. In fact, we're going to answer that question right now. So uh, okay. no, no problem. You're uh, definitely thinking ahead, which is okay. smart. Uh, the whole controversy about cooked versus raw is a fiasco created by the garlic supplement industry. And the reason is because the industry cannot just simply put garlic into a tablet. It will degrade in the store shelves long before the consumer even buys it. So to make a garlic supplement, manufacturers have to come up with a solution. And the debate is, what single chemical in garlic is the most beneficial? What can we put into a tablet form? Right? One school of camp is this. That's right, Allison. One school of camp actually believes that the odor-causing chemical is the most important and only chemical you have to worry about. It's called Allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. This is the pungent stuff when you chop onions and crush garlic and you get this massive waft of sulfuriness. That's Allicin being made right under your noses. Now the way Allicin works is it's actually converted by an enzyme known as, uh, or excuse me, by a chemical uh, called allein into Allicin by a specific enzyme. Let me put this on the blackboard too, because I think that'll answer your question about cooked versus raw a little bit more clearly. When you basically have a whole onion or a whole garlic bulb, you have allein, which is kind of like the storage form of this. It has very low odor, and it is very stable. We're talking about years. Allein can actually stay dormant for years. The reaction powered by an enzyme and triggered by oxygen. Converts this allein into a chemical called allicin. And this is the stuff that has high odor and is very unstable. We're talking about hours. If you were to crush or chop garlic, leave it on the kitchen counter overnight and come back the next day, most of the smell will have been dissipated because the allicin doesn't last very long. Now, think about how garlic and onions are structurally designed, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. In order to get at this, you have to crush or pound or chop or blend or puree. Nature has designed these items to be stable in their whole form until the moment where you cook them or use them. The whole essence behind this is that the way of providing this, getting oxygen into the cell by chopping or crushing, means that this enzyme is the missing link. Why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because of this. Enzymes are deactivated by cookery. So the claim that raw garlic is better for you than cooked garlic is simply because that manufacturer is trying to manufacture the highest amount of allicin they can. Right? Basically, they have, dare I say, an ulterior motive. 
right? So anytime you actually have studies or claims that say that cooked garlic is not as effective as raw, a practitioner who might say this or a website, it means that you automatically know what side of the fence they're on, what team they belong to. They belong to the Allison team because they believe this is the only end-all be-all found in garlic. And the most researched brand of this is a brand called Kwai. Not very popular anymore, but they were the first company to be able to, to basically deliver Allison in uh, this form. The original supplement, by the way, was packaged with each tablet in an oxygen-sealed bubble wrap. And that explains why. Stayed away from oxygen and you actually maintain this process. Mm -hmm.